Hello, everyone, and welcome to Berlin. <laughs> I'm here standing on this virtual stage for a very new experience for myself and I'm sure for you. Uh, we've been working the past few weeks to pull together something that hopefully recreates the vibe of what it would be like for you to attend uh, IFA here in Berlin. So my name is Nicole Scott. I'm a technology journalist and mobility enthusiast. So this is why we're here today to talk about hydrogen with Hyundai. So welcome to Hyundai's Tech Day. Hydrogen may become a major source of sustainable energy across the transportation and manufacturing sectors. By 2050, hydrogen could account for 18% of final energy consumed, generating $2.5 trillion in annual revenues. Hyundai is committed to realizing a hydrogen-powered future because of you. Albert Bierman is the head of R&D for Hyundai, and he has a bit of a background in automotive. So in his previous life before Hyundai, he developed high-performance vehicles for BMW. And he actually has like a lot of really interesting th things to say about why he made this transition over to Hyundai, and he's actually in Korea. So for the final stage of his career, he decided that he was done with performance and he wanted to move on to a new and more rich challenge, which is why he's going to be joining us today from Seoul. Dr. Bierman, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here in Berlin at Shift Mobility. Thank you, Nicole. It's my pleasure to be part of the Shift Mobility Conference and show Hyundai as a visionary technology-driven company, not just as a traditional automaker, but as a smart uh, mobility solution provider. So why don't we dive right in? Hyundai is a very big company that doesn't just work on cars. Can you tell us a little bit about the bigger picture about what Hyundai is working on? Yeah, it's all not so easy nowadays, you know. There's no one in the world who can accurately predict all mobility solutions uh, will look like in the future. But uh, we are pretty sure that the future will be electric. Uh, and now when most people hear the word electromobility, they think of electric cars, specifically uh, battery electric vehicles. They're not wrong, but uh, BEVs will play an important role in our future mobility. They're completely emission-free, suitable for most people's daily mobility needs in urban areas. But for frequent trips with long ranges, there's a better solution. Fuel cell electric vehicles. And when we respond into urban air mobility, we see clear advantages for our lightweight hydrogen fuel cell technology. Wait, so did you just say urban air mobility? Yeah, it's UAM. That is where hydrogen also is a very suitable. Interesting. So before we get too off track with flying cars, can you explain to me one of the most common questions that I get about fuel cell is what exactly is the difference between a battery electric vehicle and a fuel cell electric vehicle? Yeah. So for us, uh, we are working on fuel cell technology for 20 years already. And for us, fuel cell EVs are perfect for carrying heavy loads and traveling long distances and traveling fast, but also for fast refueling. And in fact, Hyundai sees huge potential for fuel cell EVs in commercial shipping sector, specifically for heavy duty trucks going long distances with a heavy load. And we are already well on our way in supplying Hyundai's fuel cell electric vehicle trucks to the Swiss market, something that my colleague Mark Freimuller at Hyundai Hydrogen Mobility will tell you more about in a bit. But if you want e-mobility solutions to truly thrive, it's not enough for them to, to be merely functional vehicles. Uh, they also have to be fun to drive. So this is where high-performance EVs uh, will also play a role in uh, Hyundai's future. So what exactly do you mean when you say high-performance? Is a fuel cell electric vehicle just as fun to drive as a pure battery electric vehicle? Yeah, I mean, in the fuel cell, a uh, heavy duty business, it's not so much about sports cars, you know, it's a big uh, 
38 ton trucks and so on. But we are also pursuing uh, in electrification area, uh, of course, work with uh, high performance uh, EVs. So we will focus on EVs, battery electric EVs, but also on fuel cell EVs. I mean, we have already our second generation uh, vehicle in the market, the Nexo, and now we bring the trucks into Switzerland. And uh, now the high performance EVs are coming inside in the newly emerging electric uh, racing championship. Uh, it's coming uh, with first demo races this year, the ETCR. And they make the motorsport more eco-friendly and uh, for the most part, I mean, they're also a lot of fun to drive. And uh, we can bring the fun part of electromobility uh, into our customers. And we, with the racing, we can go into the city then. And in addition, I mean, there's a lot of technology transfer that we are already getting right now because we are working on that ETCR race car already for quite some time. And we're already getting a lot of yeah, benefits from that development of the race car also for our road cars. So that is doing quite well already. And in fact, it may not be too long before we can see an uh, all-electric high-performance car coming from Hyundai. And uh, we are working together with partners like uh, Rimac in Croatia to optimize our high-power EV technology and so on. But the high-power EV, I mean, as a high-performance car, that's more like the icing on the cake, right? Uh, most day-to-day -day mobility needs uh, will be need more like regular battery electric EVs or fuel cell EVs. And I th we think these technologies uh, are yeah, a kind of competition, but both will exist. Yeah? And uh, they will complement each other. And everything that's really heavy, everything that really goes long distances, we can clearly see a fuel cell uh, leading in the future. And um, so, and we have already uh, our solutions uh, on the road. So we are, we are already, we passed the piloting stage already. Now we are in uh, mass production with our big uh, truck. And yeah, we are working already on the next generation of fuel cell technology. So, but anyway, we can see a peaceful coexistence between we are both technologies. And like I said, we uh, already yeah, have our solutions on the road today. When people think about hydrogen, they assume that it's a technology that's somehow far off into the future, when the truth is it's here today. I drove here to Nexo, it purified the air as I got here, and I'm fueling it up in Berlin because there are hydrogen fuel points. I'm starting to see this ecosystem that you're talking about, that it makes a lot of sense for trucks that do the long distances to be fuel cell. So what exactly is Hyundai doing to foster this hydrogen society? Yeah, that's, that's a big challenge. I mean, ICE vehicles, they have been dominating in the transportation for over 100 years. And of course, the infrastructure today looks like for ICEs. And it's time now for e-mobility infrastructure to catch up a lot. And this is why we are working together with partners such as HydroSpider and Ionity, ANBV and so on, to expand into alternative future uh, technology and infrastructure. And our strategy, Hyundai's strategy, is to create an entire emission-free ecosystem, not just the vehicles. And we want to connect the dots and offer integrated eco-mobility solutions in almost all areas, not just mobility, also for maritime applications, energy storage, hydrogen generation, and so on. Because uh, we, we know this technology for quite some time. And uh, yeah, many of our piloting stage we already passed and... Uh, yeah, we are soon ready to go in many different areas. So that's a very diverse list of ecosystems. Can you talk about how Hyundai is going to be tackling each of these sections of eco-mobility? Yeah, we are in really dynamic times right now. I mean, uh, supporting the UAM uh, project, uh, working on trucks, working on passenger cars and so on. Uh, yeah, we are really uh, having busy times right now. But, yeah, I mean, the big focus first was, of course, manufacturing emission-free vehicles, BEVs and fuel cell vehicles. And uh, early next year, we will launch our next uh, generation fully dedicated uh, modular platform for electric vehicles. That will be a new level of electric vehicle. And at the same time, we are working already on the third generation of fuel cell technology. That will bring a significant reduction in cost, will increase durability, 
and will also improve efficiency even further. And we will also develop higher power output for heavy duty applications. So this will be important steps really to scale up hydrogen technology and find more and more applications where also the business case is just around the corner. So I can see that it's clear, Hyundai is focused on a hydrogen society. And you're joining us today from Korea. Now, what exactly is a Korean company doing building infrastructure here in Europe? Oh, we are a European company. Yeah, we are developed in Europe. We have factories in Europe. Uh, so if, if you buy a Hyundai uh, in Germany, I mean, most of the value in that Hyundai comes out of Europe. So we are not considering those vehicles like Korean vehicles. So we, we, are, we feel like we are part of Europe. And, uh, of, and we also feel an obligation. Why shouldn't we help uh, to, to transform Europe into a more sustainable continent? So actually, I just have one last question for you. I was watching some of your old interviews, and you actually said that the very last vehicle that will ever be produced is a high-performance vehicle. Do you still stand by those words? Oh, definitely. Just an hour ago, I sat in one. It was a battery electric vehicle with over 800 horsepower, and it goes like hell. And we are already working on a project where we also put a fuel cell in. So I'm not worried about that statement at all. All right, then. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to be with you. So that was a very nice general overview of what Hyundai's vision is for hydrogen technology. And it's nice to hear that Mr. Bierman hasn't given up on his hope for continuing to produce high performance vehicles, but now using fuel cell technology. So now I have the pleasure to welcome into the call room Dr. Kim, who is the head of fuel cell for Hyundai. And he actually started off in 2003 with Hyundai developing the very first fuel cell. And he will actually tell us a little bit more about that while he's talking to Bertrand Picard, who is a massive voice in the, in, in the global ecosystem for promoting green and uh, sustainable renewable energies. Uh, Bertrand Picard actually holds the world record for flying around the world in a solar plane and a hot air balloon and the world record for how far one can go in a Hyundai Nexo. So just listening to these two fellas talk, I think that you are going to get some real insights onto what's happening today uh, with hydrogen technology. Dr. Kim, Bertrand, thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Kim, why don't we start with Hyundai's involvement in hydrogen and fuel cell? Okay, so actually uh, I joined uh, Hyundai Motor Company in 2003, but our fuel cell activity was uh, started in 1998. And I think why we did fuel cell is we were very curious what will be the next powertrain, yeah? What is the beyond uh, internal combustion engine vehicles? And at that time we thought uh, we have to use democratic energy. So the energy what we use should be equal to everyone and it, sh it should be, you know, whether you're rich or poor, everyone can benefit the energy and uh, the powertrain which you could realize that was fuel cell. So since then we have been developing fuel cell technology but we, even I in 2003 did not believe that we can mass produce the fuel cell because the technology level was very low. Yeah. At that time, our durability was only three, uh, three months. So after three months, you have to replace the stack. And the stack cost at the time was $1.2 billion. Uh, $1 million. So Whoa. it's uh, more expensive than even the best apartment in Korea at that time. Yeah? But uh, fortunately, uh, we have been uh, in a good way. And we were the first company to mass produce fuel cell vehicle in 2013. And in 2018, we were able to provide Nexo vehicle, uh, which is comparable to today's internal combustion engine vehicles in the performance. Of course, the price is a little bit high, 
but you will see, you know, as I explained, uh, since 2003, we have been cutting down the cost for 120th, and there is still potential to decrease the cost. So I think we can provide affordable uh, vehicle, fuel cell vehicle for everyone in the future. Now, can you give me an idea about Hyundai's larger vision for hydrogen technology? Yeah, not only hydrogen. Hyundai, actually, you know, in the future, there will be two powertrain. One will be battery, one will be hydrogen fuel cell. Because uh, anyway, the, the energy will come from the solar. The wind is coming made by solar. Yeah, and hydraulic energy is also, you know, the, the source is solar energy. So we will use the solar energy, not digging the ground. We'll see the a sky now. Yeah? So uh, anyway, we'll use the solar. And how you use the solar energy will be two ways. You use battery electric vehicle, or you uh, transform this electricity to hydrogen form and use it. So uh, there is two types of powertrain in the future. And we think the, these two powertrain will coexist anyway. And that's why Hyundai is uh, investing in battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles all together. So as a company, when we, when we compete in the future mobility uh, industry, we have two cards. So we have battery and we have fuel cell. I think Hyundai is in good position in that way. So Bertrand, thanks so much for hanging tight and thank you so much for joining us. Now you've actually driven a Nexo and you've set a world record on range. So you're very qualified to speak on how exactly this technology fits into our real world. You know, after flying around the world in an electric airplane that was powered only by solar energy, I cannot drive anything else than a zero emission car. So I started with a Kona from Hyundai that is full electric and I have more than 400 kilometers of range. So it's absolutely perfect for my use. And of course, I'm very much interested with the hydrogen fuel cell uh, Nexo from Hyundai. And uh, I made the world record of distance uh, with only one tank of six kilos of hydrogen. And uh, I reached 778 kilometers of range. But I could have made 800. I just needed to leave a little bit of, of range for the team to bring the car back for refueling after the record. So, so you see, the limit is pushed back so much that now we have better performance with a zero emission car than with a gasoline or diesel car. And what I find very, very important is to emphasize that it is not only for climate change that we need to have zero emission cars. It's also for air quality. It's also for health. We have today 7 million people dying every year of air pollution because of uh, the, the particles that are emitted by internal combustion engines. So when we drive a zero emission car, we drive clean, we drive much more efficient because even if we have a fuel cell with hydrogen, this is to activate an uh, electric engine. And an electric engine today is 97% efficient compared to a combustion engine that is only 27% efficient. So it's a question of efficiency. It's a question of health, quality of air. But also, and I hope you will all make this experience, it's a question of comfort. You have no noise. You have no vibration. You have a better torque, which means a better acceleration, which means that you are driving in much better condition. And additionally to this, you protect the environment. So it's clear that the future is zero emission car, battery driven or fuel cell with hydrogen driven, exactly like Dr. Kim was saying. So I'm also driving a Nexo right now, and I can agree with you that it is very fun to drive. <laughs> I'm very happy that you're satisfied with Nexo. So now, Dr. Kim, one of the most common questions that I get, and maybe you can help me out with this, is how exactly does a fuel cell EV work? Okay, so it is very simple. Maybe you all have learned about electrolysis in your uh, middle school uh, class or in the elementary school. So uh, electrolysis is uh, water splitting with electricity. Uh, to the water, you put electricity and water will split into hydrogen and oxygen. And if you just do this reverse way, 
you put hydrogen and oxygen together and you create electricity and water. Yeah, that's all. Very simple. So hydrogen is a fuel, so we have to put into the vehicle as a fuel. But oxygen, we can use the oxygen in the air in the same way as the internal combustion engine. So fuel cell is just an electrochemical uh, you know, device that transfers hydrogen to proton and electron. And these electron runs the motor and the car goes. So uh, it is just a reverse reaction of electrolysis, simply. But to realize that, it had taken a long time because the efficiency of the fuel cell was very low. So actually, uh, fuel cell, when, I, when you see the patent in 19, uh, 1955, the performance of fuel cell was about one two hundredth of today's fuel cell. So at that time, even in 1955, you cannot imagine that fuel cell could be a powertrain for cars because the power it can produce was very low. But today, we have a lot of 100 kilowatt range of fuel cells, and we can even make 200 and put lots of stack together to megawatt and gigawatt state scale. So now we have developed the technologies far, so far that we can easily use it in the passenger cars. And we can use it in the trucks and ships. And maybe in some day when we have a more power density, we can even use it in the uh, aircraft. Yeah? So technology is evolving very fast. So it is not, you know, uh, every technology improves faster and faster. So it will not take so long. You can see flying uh, airplanes with uh, fuel cells or big ships. Yeah. Bertrand, so what exactly do you think about flying a hydrogen plane? You know, actually, the first idea with solar impulse was to fly with fuel cell and hydrogen, uh, but it was not ready at that time. So now I'm absolutely open to collaborate with Dr. Kim to make an airplane with hydrogen, and we can do it, I think, very fast because uh, Hyundai has the perfect technology for that. So let's do it now. Well, there's a lot of uh, discussions now. Uh, even uh, there's a latest McKinsey report uh, about discussing what kind of requirements are needed for fuel cell to be applied in airplanes. So now it is being discussed. Yeah? And uh, more important is, you know, hydrogen has been discussed from the specialist in, before, but today we are very happy because uh, this year, German government has announced their a hydrogen national roadmap, and EU also, and we were waiting for uh, UK and also France. So Germany and EU already announced that they will go for hydrogen society, and they have made a specific targets, they made specific organizations, and I think 2020 is the starting year of hydrogen society, and I'm very excited. You know, we speak of Europe, Germany, preparing plans and programs for the future at the government level. But I think it's the moment to remind to everyone that Switzerland is already doing it on a complete private level and it worked extremely well. I was last July at the launch of the Hyundai hydrogen truck program. How does, how does it work? Because, you know, if, if the, the users don't have a hydrogen station, they don't buy the truck or the car. If uh, the people producing the hydrogen don't have the trucks or the cars, they will not produce it. So what happened in Switzerland? There was a coalition between supermarket distributors, between gas stations, between a hydrogen producer, and they said to Hyundai, if you bring 1,000 trucks, 1,000 trucks, and it's a big fleet with hydrogen. We have all the program ready. We have the distribution, we have the users, we have the clean production. And Hyundai agreed, and the first truck arrived in July. And uh, at the end of this year, we will have already gas stations for hydrogen all along Switzerland, 
from northeast to southwest, so people can drive there. And if you have trucks, you can have cars. The Nexo are going to uh, take a lot of success uh, thanks to this new program. And this is done without subsidies and with a hydrogen cost that is the same than diesel gasoline. So, so, so you see, it's already the present. So when you, we hear people who say hydrogen is the future, it's wrong. Hydrogen is the present, it already works, it's profitable and it's efficient. Well, I agree to you. Uh, you know, many people say that hydrogen technology is very expensive. But they're saying that because they heard about hydrogen and fuel cell technology, which is 10 years or 15 years before. Today, we're advancing very fast. So our target is to use almost the same amount of platinum. In the, in the past, I agree, we used about 20 times more platinum than the internal combustion engine vehicles. But today, we are near the amount. And we don't use it only to purify the exhaust gas, but we are producing the power with the same amount. And uh, many people ask that, you know, still fuel cell uh, technology is expensive than battery. But uh, battery industry has been doing it for a long, long time. And battery was, uh, you know, produced uh, for your mobile phones, for your computers. And it was, uh, you know, beside our life for a long time. But hydrogen fuel cell technology is very new and the production amount is not that much. So we, hydrogen technology did not benefit from the mass production effect until now. So when we can start mass production in a real big amount, I'm sure that hydrogen technology can be just, you know, in a similar uh, level of battery technology and they will really coexist and really be uh, affordable for normal people. And especially knowing that gasoline or diesel cars will be prohibited in most of the cities within five years. So if we want to keep individual mobility, it's clear that we need battery and uh, uh, hydrogen driven zero emission mobility. Otherwise, there will really be a problem. And uh, Paris has a fleet today of taxi, taxi fully hydrogen driven. Uh, and they are driving their, their cons customers and users uh, everywhere in the city. And this is a joint venture with Air Liquide, who is providing the, the hydrogen. So we see that it starts to be, today, a new dimension in the business. It creates jobs. It makes profit. It's a new industry coming, new, new outcome. And uh, we have observed this with the Solar Impulse Foundation. Uh, at our foundation, we are selecting and labeling technological solutions that protect the environment in a profitable way. So we observe the technologies under the angle of the feasibility. It has to be credible today, not a vague ID for the future, but really something for today. It needs to protect the environment and it needs to be financially profitable for the company who produces it and for the con consumer. And uh, we put the label, Solar Impulse Efficient Solution label, and we have today 670, 670 of such solutions that we are bringing to governments, that we are bringing to the industry, bringing to the media also to show what is possible today. And uh, hydrogen is a part of it. We have several uh, solutions that uh, are linked to, to hydrogen how to compress this hydrogen, how to transport it in a liquid form, how to be more efficient. And uh, we see that more and more hydrogen will also go not only in the engine of cars, trucks, ships and airplanes, but hydrogen is also going to be used to make steel. Because the steel industry needs very, very high temperature. And up to now, it was coal that was used, the gas coming out of the coal and uh, it will be replaced by hydrogen. So we see that it's, it's a completely new industry that is raising from uh, the, the hydrogen uh, technology. And more than this, there has been some reports showing that if you invest in these new technologies, you create much more jobs than when you invest in the oil 
uh, and uh, fossil energy uh, industry. So, so really, the, the, the people who want to make good business now have to reorient themselves in this direction, otherwise they will just disappear from the market. Mr. Picard, uh, if I add a little bit, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, tell you about the book of Jeremy Rifkin recently. The title is Green, Green New Deal or something. In this book, he said that uh, there, is, there was industry revolution. So the first industry revolution was, you know, you have to have three things to make an industry revolution. One is the communication, energy, and then the mobility. So in the first uh, uh, industry revolution, there was printing and newspapers, yeah, and uh, moose, uh, da, 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 yeah, you know, moose, and the energy was coal, and the mobility was a steam engine, yeah, and the second in, uh, industry revolution with, was with uh, telephone, radio, yeah, and t television, and the energy was oil. And the, the transportation media was the vehicles with internal combustion engine. Now we are ready for third industry revolution because we have renewable energy, solar, wind, and we have 5G internet, IoT, new communication system. And now we have powertrain like fuel cell and battery. Yeah? So, Everything can change and we are in the situation of beginning of third revolution and everything will change. This industry revolution comes once in 100 years and we have to be prepared of that, I think. I fully agree. I fully agree with you. And I think there is an additional advantage in hydrogen. It's the fact that we can make an alliance with the oil companies because today the oil companies are employing a lot of people and uh, they cannot go bankrupt. They need to diversify. They need a reconversion into a new liquid that is cleaner to be sold to their consumers. And hydrogen is a perfect liquid to be sold. Hydrogen can be produced by oil companies, distributed, sold by oil companies, uh, so it will not make a financial crisis when we all go to zero emission cars. So this is important. It's also important for the utilities. Uh, if you have a constant flow of renewable energy, you can fill up your battery in your car. And as Dr. Kim was saying, the efficiency is better because almost all the electricity you put in the battery comes out for the engine. Uh, but if you have an intermittent source of renewable energy, like solar, like wind. Sometimes you don't have enough, sometimes you have too much. Germany very often has too much sun and wind together. And uh, they have to pay the consumers to, to use this electricity, otherwise the grid is exploding. So at this moment, you can produce hydrogen from your excessive amount of wind or solar energy. You produce hydrogen, and this hydrogen is produced for free. It's for free. And then you use it everywhere. You can use it in a fuel cell for your house. You can use it to make steel with a, with a gaseous hydrogen. And you can put it in your cars, in your trucks, in your boats, in your airplanes, everywhere. So it is, I would really say that hydrogen was until now the missing piece of the puzzle. And now it gives hope to a lot of people. We have been living in the oil industry too long. So we don't trust anything else. So what we need from government is not just like you know, subsidies like, like that, but the, the biggest thing what we need from the government is the correct direction and confidence. Then the money will move. There is a lot of investor companies or banks, they want to invest somewhere, but they don't know where. And there was always uncertainty in investing to the renewables and hydrogens and so on. But when the government gives the correct direction, and it is being made this year from German government, EU, we are waiting for Germany, I mean UK, France, and also China. So if these commitments are gathered, then I think the money will move and we'll accelerate the development.
and accelerate the uh, you know, infrastructure for all this new society. Now, what do you think, Picard, Mr. Picard? Yes, I think it's absolutely true. And in addition to this, what we need from the government is a very ambitious environmental regulation. Because if we are honest, what do we observe? We observe that it is still absolutely legal to pollute. We can put CO2 in the atmosphere, we can put toxic particles in the lungs of the citizens. It is allowed. Imagine a regulation that will not be so complacent, regulation that would be much tougher in terms of environment. This would push the electric mobility, battery or hydrogen driven cars and trucks everywhere. And this will be the best signal that governments could give in order to really promote clean mobility. So that was a very strong statement to end things on. Bertrand, Dr. Kim, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights about hydrogen's potential for today and in the future. So those were two definite industry experts who have given us a really nice snapshot of how hydrogen is here today and a lot of the challenges that they see us overcoming rolling out this technology. And the question of infrastructure has kind of weighed as an overall trend on how hydrogen, or question, sorry, on how hydrogen will be rolling out. And so up next, I've actually got to chat with Yargo Shatsimakakis, who is the Secretary General for Hydrogen Europe. He's a former EU Parliament member, and he's very, very active in working towards how hydrogen is going to be a viable technology and source of energy for all of Europe. So Yorgo, thanks so much for taking the time to join us at Shift Mobility here in Berlin. How are you today? Brilliant and excellent um, because um, every day is, is good, better for hydrogen. Makes me enthusiast. Yeah, abs absolutely. I actually drove here in a hydrogen car today, so I know that hydrogen is here today. It's not some sort of future technology. It's something that we have on the roads and, and it's tangible. Absolutely. So uh, tomorrow school starts again for my children. Uh, so uh, later than in other countries possibly and uh, I'm typically driving also the kids to school with my hydrogen car which in this case is a Hyundai Nexo uh, I'm in love and my children are also in love they know they cannot imagine anything else daddy should drive so it's a mature technology it works on an everyday basis I'm super happy so what why do you believe that hydrogen is the future well our problem is that we are not as smart as the Iroquois Indian tribe people were in today's US territory in um, medieval times because they said we need to think seven generations in advance. So every thing we politically decide, every step we take will have long during um, consequences and we need to think from the seventh generation. Today, one might say the third generation would all already be enough, but this is the case for hydrogen. As we have, um, unfortunately, uh, not electrified the world in the 20s of the last century, uh, we knew about hydrogen already, but oil, gas were cheaper. We failed uh, to do something for our next generations by yeah, bringing fossil energy into the atmosphere. And today we are seeing what that serves, that serves the global warming, the global uh, climate change. And this is something uh, we, should really, um, um, we should really accept. So this is why hydrogen plays the role of the missing link, bringing um, renewables and bringing existing infrastructure better together. Um, we can say that um, electrons, uh, so from renewables are an excellent choice and this is absolutely the priority to produce rather than fossil energy from fossil energy from renewables the electrons however there are shortcomings limitations restrictions when it comes to the grid and here's where hydrogen joins in uh, hydrogen is a molecule hydrogen can be transported via pipelines 10 to 20 times cheaper than via a wire via the electricity grid and this is what makes it so attractive basically in a 
defossilized, decarbonized world, we would need massively um, renewably produced hydrogen or decarbonized hydrogen that then will be disseminated through these pipelines. This is a cheap way uh, of uh, bringing our system, our economy into a net zero carbon uh, economy. Uh, and that is what makes hydrogen so attractive. So in part, you're saying that hydrogen will be rolled out using existing infrastructure already. Yes, uh, we have a very dense uh, gas grid in Europe. Uh, basically, um, what we did as Europeans is we rolled out uh, a very, very uh, modern system to carry natural gas in the 70s. Uh, there was already an existing gas grid um, for a town gas, which was uh, uh, the, the result of uh, the uh, gasification from coal. Mm -hmm. But the natural gas influx uh, first from North Sea, uh, countries like Norway and Netherlands, later on from uh, uh, Russia, um, uh, created, led to the fact that we have a very, very solid uh, and really, really strong gas infrastructure. What we now do is um, we know that most of these gas pipelines can be used for hydrogen with some retrofitting. The retrofitting is much cheaper than building a new pipeline. So it's a quarter and even less of the cost. And what we are doing at the moment is we are linking industrial clusters uh, with uh, uh, these pipelines. So we use existing pipelines between industrial clusters and turn them into hydrogen clusters, uh, sorry, hydrogen pipelines. Um, and this will lead in the, in the medium term also to clean corridors. That is our aim, to have a clean corridor. Let me take a, a very simple example from Sicily in Southern Europe to Scandinavia. It's the ScanMed 10T corridor. And we could turn this a clean corridor by feeding the existing pipeline infrastructure with hydrogen, possibly from Northern Africa, because the pipeline exists. So solar power hydrogen that comes through this pipeline and then feed all the um, hydrogen refueling stations all the way for trucks. We could then have long haul on a clear zero emission basis. And this is exactly uh, what we are not only thinking of, we are planning this uh, very concretely in the European Union. You know, it's, it's been pretty interesting over the course of uh, Shift and all of the interviews that I've been doing with people at Hyundai, I was, I was very shocked to realize that a lot of the numbers about how expensive things were are maybe from 10 years ago. You know, it's actually much cheaper to produce it today than it was even just like two or three years ago. There's a lot of companies that are like producing through seawater, from garbage. It's actually quite stunning the, the places, the, the renewable energy places where you can create hydrogen from. That's exactly the point. Uh, we were and I remember very well, I mean, we, we have 2020 this year. Uh, I um, introduced to my own board uh, a quite ambitious plan to have a two times 40 gigawatt electro electrolyzer uh, alliance, electrolyzer uh, production in Europe and in neighboring countries, two times 40 gigawatt. This was argued and, and this was disputed in the board. But finally, we put it on the road and Thanks, I shouldn't say thanks to Corona, but uh, because of the, the catalyst of uh, this uh, pandemic, the Commission, the European Commission was eager to get these plans in order to implement the European Green Deal. And I have to say we were super yeah, successful and uh, also yeah, happy to uh, see this as, a, as an instrumental, as a big part of the European Green Deal. And now we can achieve these volumes and we can see the prices go down. So it's something that two years ago, even in January, uh, was a little bit of wishful thinking. Thanks, thanks to uh, the sector, thanks to a lot of um, CEOs and a lot of industrial partners in, in the hydrogen technology sector, um, we could underpin our commitment to go this way. At the same time, politics, um, the European Commission, many member states, uh, France will follow Germany, um, um, Italy, Portugal, uh, these member states said we clearly believe in that future and that make 
made this disruptive change possible. Um, and that is why prices will fall. It will become normal to fuel the car with hydrogen, be it liquid later on, be it gases, uh, and to have a normal life like I have it at the moment and like my children are enjoying it already today. Yeah, and, and I genuinely feel that the movement within a lot of countries is to focus on renewable energy. And I think that the pandemic has really made us think about, hey, where, where do we get our power from? How do we create this and how can we have a more sustainable future? Exactly. So, uh, and we are about there to make this change. And Hydrogen Europe, the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, is ready to go. Thank you. So that was Yorgo Shatsimakakis, who was the Secretary of Hydrogen Europe, and he paints a very optimistic future for how hydrogen is going to be a very viable technology for all of Europe. Now, up next, we have, to me, the most exciting part, uh, because it is a live panel discussion. And in times of corona, this is something that's a little bit new for me as a moderator on a virtual stage and for our participants who will be emerging quite shortly out of the mist. <laughs> so we have three experts joining us today who are going to paint a picture for how hydrogen is viable and how it is going to be emerging into society. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Hello, so everybody. on the bottom, we have Mark Freimuller, who is the CEO of Hyundai Hydrogen Europe. How are you doing? Hey, everyone. Hi, Nicole. Doing fine. Hope you the same way. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. Yeah. And then we also have Stefan uh, Linder from Alpique, who is a Swiss energy manufacturer. Stefan, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you very much, Nicole. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> and then we finally have Marcus Guzman, who works for Hydrogenius, a company that converts hydrogen to liquid form and then miraculously transports it around Europe for us. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much. So, Mark, I'm going to start with you. So, Fuel Cell has been around for... Uh, Mark. <laughs> There you are. <laughs> so I'm going to start with you. So fuel cell technology has been around for a long time, and it has yet to catch on. So I really want to kind of dig in and explain to our audience like, why it hasn't caught on as a technology. If it's so great, it's so green, it's so environmental, why isn't it like, really here today? <laughs> Well, I think we're getting there. Um, so it's more important probably why do we get now to the point where I think it's getting more and more important. It, it's just a matter of timing, I think. I mean, first of all, and it was discussed um, earlier as well, uh, there's a shift in focus of the society, I think, um, that's switching towards a more more greener um, mindset. Um, there's a much higher awareness now of, of the um, ecological problems we have. So I think it's it's just the right time now for a new um, emission-free technology. And then second of all, obviously the technology itself gets better as well, right? So it's getting more, yeah, it's getting better, it's getting more, more, more efficient, it's getting cheaper by that. So we're getting out of this demo mode um, and we will see more sustainable, ecologically and economically sustainable, viable business cases. And that would obviously help um, to get this, um, this technology um, really into a, into a mainstream. I mean, every every new technology faces this chicken egg um, dilemma and, and Bertrand Picard briefly talked about that already. So the demand and the supply need to match. Now, from, from a trucking perspective, that means that nobody will buy a truck if there is no hydrogen refueling station and nobody will spend the money for a hydrogen refueling station if there is no consumer for hydrogen around, right? So I think it's important for every business case, but in particular ours as well, to bring up the, the infrastructure and, and grow that together with the number of trucks coming into the country. And then by proving that it's going to be viable, um, I mean, financially and economically viable, um, we will see more and more of these business cases popping up and it gets more and more popular and mainstream, I would say. 
So we do have a, a very strong business case to talk about, and it's kind of why all three of you are, are here today with us, because uh, Bertrand Picard actually referred to it as, and he was very excited about the fact that in Switzerland there are trucks rolling out, and it's not have, it's not really subsidized by the government, and it's you know it's a, it's a use case that's here today. Now. Uh, Hyundai is rolling out the trucks on October 7th, and then uh, Alpeak is going to be helping to fuel them, right, by creating energy. And then, Marcus, your technology is about bringing the hydrogen around Europe. So we have a little bit of an ecosystem just within this panel about how hydrogen is a viable use case for today. Uh, Stefan, do you want to uh, dis discuss about your, your role in this, this whole p picture? I mean, what's an energy electricity provider doing working in hydrogen? Yeah, yeah, first, uh, perhaps you have to a little bit take a step back and consider, you know, that uh, still today about 80% of the global energy demand is satisfied by fossil uh, fuels. Uh, and only about 10% is uh, from uh, low carbon uh, renewable electricity. Uh, but if we want to move away from uh, from these fossil uh, fuels, uh, we will es eventually have to go just to 100% or close to 100% electric, uh, electric energy provision. And so therefore, as, a, as an electricity uh, generation company, and especially as Alpig is, uh, generation company who focuses mainly on, on low carbon electricity for us it's obviously a very important element of the future and we heard it before how hydrogen will be important and we share also this uh, and uh, we think therefore we uh, it is uh, it is going to be an important element of our our future business and also it gives us uh, very good uh, business opportunities uh, in the future. It's, it's a viable business, as Mark has explained. Uh, and, uh, and we are deeply convinced of this. And uh, just by building the first uh, hydrogen production plant that we, uh, what we have done this year, uh, we have also started to put that into reality. And Marcus, do you have anything to add? Yes, I mean, uh... The uh, Hydrogenius LLC Technologies Company is involved in that uh, hydrogen, uh, let's say, uh, society when it comes to the import of hydrogen from or renewable energy from areas where you have abundance of energy or wind energy. And uh, actually, I'm not sure, is the connection right? I have this echo. Yeah, right I, can, I, I can hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, um, Already, the German national budget strategy has uh, um, commented on the fact that about 80% of the renewable energy that is going to be required uh, within Central Europe needs to be imported. And uh, our company actually provides uh, the missing element, the missing piece of the puzzle, to actually import the hydrogen from, from other regions, uh, may it be Southern Europe, Spain, Italy, which has to be mentioned, Romania or other companies, or even beyond, think of the Middle Eastern region, where hydrogen can be produced and then imported on a low cost basis to Central Europe. And uh, the fact that our technology is utilizing the existing infrastructure, I think provides a very important element because what we see is hydrogen, if it wants, should be su successful and successfully be accepted by society, it needs to be available everywhere at any time now can can you just comment on the safety of transporting hydrogen one of the things that you often hear people speak about is oh do we want a large hydrogen fuel tank around that seems very dangerous uh like how, how safe is hydrogen i mean hydrogen as a molecule is pretty safe it's well understood and it's utilized by industrial gas companies on a professional basis since decades already Large volumes are stored and handled on a daily basis. Uh, I think it's well understood. Uh, it's not uh, an unsafe uh, molecule. However, I think applying our technology, we improve the safety aspects because you can store and transport hydrogen at ambient conditions. So without pressurized containers, you can literally carry it around in a little bucket as it's liquefied in our liquid organic hydrocarrying molecule. And I think this is something that is pretty much acceptable by the society. If you think about having a large volume storage hydrogen right in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, thinking about transportation of hydrogen in densely populated areas, thinking about transporting through tunnels uh, and such a thing. We, we have a solution at hand that uh, improves the safety aspects and, as I said before, makes it more acceptable for the broader society. Perfect. So I just want to remind everyone who's uh, watching this panel that you can ask questions. I'm not the only one who gets to ask the panelist questions. Uh, in the extended space, you'll see a, a red button uh, there. So you just click on there, drop your questions in, and then I'll be able to see them here on the tablet. So, uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you an additional. Oh, yeah, actually, you, you wanted to comment, I can see. <laughs> yeah, can I just uh, add Absolutely, something to the please. aspect? Because um, I think from a day to day basis, you need to know that, that, that um, hydrogen is the lightest element you can find on the planet, right? Or in the universe, basically. So, so it, it goes 32 meters up in one second. So it's, it's, it's not sneaking around on the floor and waiting for a cigarette to drop. It's, it's basically by nature and already quite um, easy to handle or safe, um, safe molecule. And when it comes to the, to the vehicles itself, I mean, our, our tanks, yes, they have. 350 bar, effectively 700 bar on the passenger car side. But I mean, those tanks are really bulletproof. And I mean, literally bulletproof, right? <laughs> so it's, it, I mean, we, we really shot at them and just to make sure that it's super safe. I think, um, I agree, we have to do more in regards to education of, or, or letting the people know that it's safe to handle this. Um, it's new, so everything which is new is usually a little bit uh, looked at from a, yeah. With, you know, with, with yeah. mixed feelings, let me put Absolutely. it this way. But I think a couple of years down the road, it will be uh, people would get used to it, and it's it's totally accepted. Yeah, actually, I I drove here in a Nexo, and so I feel a little bit more reassured that you're telling me that someone shot a gun at the tank <laughs> to make sure that it's safe. <laughs> so, um, Actually, Mark, my, my next question is, is, is for you. So um, what economic problems can be resolved to make the technology more affordable? So to what extent is you know, the social and like, the, how, like how we need to change people's minds in order to start using the, this type of technology? I think pe people's minds will be changed automatically if we, if we show that it's um, just so uh, you know that it works that it that it's an not only from an ecological perspective the right thing to do but it's also from an economically perspective um the right thing to have um and that it that it just that it just works um it's a matter of scalability i think so the more we are well, like i mentioned before the more we leave this this uh, world of of demo programs and the more we show that it's really um working like 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 uh, like any other business case as well. Um, there is this scalability, and by by the scalability, everything gets cheaper as well. So um, then, obviously, we with let's say for for example, we start with a truck, right? And we start with a truck because the, the the hydrogen consumption is higher than on a passenger car. So you just need 12 to 15 trucks to have a viable business case for an HRS for a hydrogen refueling station, so a refueling station. Um, to operate, um, and that then gives also the opportunity for passenger cars to to refuel, and then that again increases the hydrogen production. So, after a while, once we once you, once you break this chicken egg dilemma, basically, it in the long run or mid run it becomes a self propelling system. Stefan, I know you have something to add to that because in our pre interview, you had a, you had a lot to say about that to add on. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely agree with Mark. You know, the, um, as Mark has also, also mentioned, you know, uh, in order to have a hydrogen um, a, a ecosystem, we need all the elements in place at the same time. So it's of no use if we produce a lot of hydrogen, uh, but there's no demand for it, or if there's no means uh, just to transport the hydrogen from the production side, just to the uh, afterwards to the demand, and that, that, that's why it's extremely important that all the elements fit together at the same time, and uh, and we need all these parties uh, just to just to build it up all together at the same time. Amazing. Now, um, when we talk about creating hydrogen, uh, one of the things is is that uh, people often say that it's not very efficient right now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, uh, for, first of all, uh, I think efficiency 
uh, has more than one aspect. Uh, people always talk about drivetrain efficiency, but efficiency has more aspects. Uh, for instance, uh, in heavy duty transport, it's also uh, the range payload uh, trade off. But I'll let Mark comment on this. Uh, I would like to make a different point. You know, uh, efficiency is perhaps not. Uh, what uh, what really is the most important parameter what what's important you know why are we doing all this we're, we're doing all this just to decarbonize uh the the mobility for instance uh, and so what counts really is uh, the carbon balance uh and now what uh, also uh, bertrand has a little bit touched upon before you know the more we build up uh, renewables uh, renewables deliver uh, the electricity uh, nature dictates when it uh, when the electricity comes and the more we build up the renewables, the more we are going to create a problem that we have a supply demand mismatch. And especially we're going to have more and more electricity for which we don't have any use at this particular time and it's being produced. So what you actually need is a means just to absorb and to harness all uh, this electricity and con convert it into something useful uh, uh, instead of just uh, uh, releasing it to nature or whatever. Uh, and so a hydrogen in that sense is the perfect means because you can absorb uh, actually unlimited quantities of such electricity and bring it into other sectors. It's not only mobility, but as Bertrand has also explained, also in industry uh, needs a lot of hydrogen and hydrogen is sometimes just a better solution than electricity. Mark? Yeah, totally agree with uh, what Stefan just said. I mean, um, just purely looking at the efficiency is probably the, the the wrong aspect. But if you even if you look at the efficiency from a transportation perspective again, um, it's about bringing goods from A to B and battery technology on heavy duty trucking side at least. Um, and don't get me wrong, battery technology has its place in in small applications probably. But on the heavy duty trucking side, um, fuel cell makes much more sense because it's about getting you know moving goods from from A to B. And if you then take into consideration how much payload is left with much heavier battery technology, what is the range, and then compare that, uh, even from a purely efficiency calculation, it's a quite easy calculation. Um, like I said, fuel cell much, makes much more sense. Excellent. Maybe I can add to that. Marcus? Um, I think efficiency is only one important parameter one needs to look into. And thinking from the perspective of the end consumer, you need to have a solution that is available at any time, anywhere you can think of. It needs to be as practical as the solution you have today based on gasoline technology, for instance. And I think hydrogen really provides a more comprehensive set of benefits and uh, overall is much more attractive compared to other solutions like electric mobility, for instance. So I don't would like to see it reduced simply to the efficiency factor, I think it's a set of performance indicators uh, we need to look into. And I think, uh, again, as, as we said, hydrogen is something that really delivers on a more broader basis and provides a solution that is much more acceptable for the society. So, Marcus, I, I do have one follow up question. So, what do you see the role of technology playing in a hydrogen society? I think technology is very important, as we just heard through other discussions uh, before and right now in another discussion. I think uh, we, we, as, as Hydrogenius, we have a very, very innovative approach. Um, it's a game-changing technology, I would say, we would like to introduce. And every day brings uh, new innovations and any step forward to reduce the cost, to improve efficiency, and to make it more practical. So, Innovation is happening on a daily basis and looking at the cost basis from 10 years ago to today, a lot of things happen throughout the value chain. Thinking about the electrical energy production on the one hand side, the logistics, the electrolyzer technology, and, 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 and as well on, on the side of our technology. Uh, and last but not least, fuel cell technology being applied on a broader basis now in, uh, in, uh, in the Hyundai Exo, for instance. Uh, that gives you an impression that on a daily basis, innovation takes place and it becomes better. So having this said, innovation means that also funding is required. And we are very happy to hear uh, that uh, many nations, the European Union, are supporting you financially and funding those projects because that will help to materialize the projects and materialize or make the technology more mature and applicable and as such more successful in the market. 
Yeah, I think that this this kind of bigger picture and how uh, hydrogen is, is, is rolling out is something that we have seen throughout uh, the course of this whole discussion. And I think we definitely have to address the elephant in the virtual room, which is uh, Corona. And uh, Yorgo Shatsimakakis actually mentioned in his talk that he thought it was one of the best things to happen to the adoption of hydrogen technology. I was wondering if you had uh, any perspective on how you s like see the acceleration of hydrogen thanks to us finally seeing blue sky in Nepal a few months ago. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I guess Thomas um, is, uh, is, is right to a certain degree that um, these corona recovery plans are now connected also to a lot of the um, hydrogen strategies, right? That does not mean that, that all these hydrogen strategies which are currently popping up in European countries um, um, are, are based on the corona issue. I mean, obviously, people worked on that quite long before <laughs> that. So um, I think those version, those, 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 those national roadmaps um, will be combined now. So, I mean, the Corona recovery plans will now be combined with those national um, fuel cell roadmaps, which is good. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think it, it helps in this case that we're not trying to get back where we were exactly before Corona, mm -hmm. but this getting back has a more green touch to it now. And that certainly helps the, the whole hydrogen development uh, to get into a hydrogen society. Stefan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's kind of difficult to tell, you know, if, if we look at the pre-corona uh, time, you know, there was a lot of discussion about climate change and, uh, and everyone appeared to be focused on, on trying to make the transition. Uh, and corona has just shifted a little bit uh, also the priorities and unfortunately corona also costs the societies a lot of money and uh, and there can also be a little bit the concern you know that uh, just the financial means of, of the societies will no longer be so good uh, just that they can support such uh, such technologies in the same way as they would have been able without corona uh, so uh, that there will be a lot of work just to bring our economies back, uh, on again and uh, yeah it it, it can be positive on one aspect, but but uh, but it, it it also has has some of the, uh, some problems, I guess. And uh, Marcus, I actually wanted to start off a new question with you. Um, we've seen uh, lots of talk about hydrogen and how it's an emerging and developing technology. Uh, where do you see it being in ten years? Uh, I see hydrogen being implemented on a broad basis. Uh, you see. Currently, right now already, there are European projects currently being developed. A uh, project in Spain, Portugal, Romania, uh, with the ambition to produce green hydrogen in these regions and to plan import it to Central Europe to make it available for mobility, for industrial applications and such. Uh, so these projects will materialize within the next five years from now. And I think that already will be a large industrial scale demonstration plan, uh, let's say, yeah, basis. Mm -hmm. So we will see that already been implemented in the next five years. And I think once that stuff is uh, being made, uh, it will be rolled out on a much better basis than by 2030. I, I would expect that many more hydrogen fuel cars will be visible on the, on the streets and it will become more acceptable by the society. Perfect. So uh, just to remind our audience, we're going to be going to Q&A shortly. So in the extended space, you just hit that little red button and it should take you to uh, a place where you can shoot questions directly to my tablet. All right. So, uh, Mark, uh, where do you see uh, the Hydrogen Society being in the next 10 years? Well, in the next 10 years, I would guess it's pretty normal. Um, people would get used to it. Um, I'm not saying it's the new standard, right? I, that, that would be nice, but I... I think it, 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 uh, that takes a little bit longer. But anyways, I mean, the infrastructure will be there from an automotive perspective. We will have much more OEMs in the market. I would guess that every OEM will be with a hydrogen car in the market then as well, no, but not, not just on the passenger car side, but also on the trucking and bus side. Um, and we will see, I think, much more other non-automotive applications for hydrogen as well that be ships and trains and um, and, and uh, emergency battery system emergency systems and um, 
I think it's like I said, it's it's going to be much more normal than what we think um, it, it will look like today. Stefan, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. First of all, I, I agree completely with Mark, but uh, at the same time, we should also not <laughs> underestimate the magnitude of the problem. You know, just, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we are just uh, our energy supply still relies on 80% on fossil energy. So in order to change that, you know, that's, that's not going to take five years or anything. It's, it, it, it's really, it's, it's a job that's going to take us decades. Uh, and, uh, and so we should not overestimate, you know, how far we are in 10 years from now, but, but I'll be happy, you know, if, as Mark has explained, if, if uh, all uh, these solutions have, uh, are accepted by, by the society and that we are well into developing the infrastructure that we need for it. Perfect. So I'm going to start to take some questions from the audience. Uh, Marcus, um, from a technology and infrastructure view, um, what role do you see tech play? Oh, actually, I already asked you that. So perfect. Oh. <laughs> so that was, must have been an old question. Um, Mark? Uh, what economic problems do you think are going to be solved uh, by hydrogen? Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's emission free, right? And important of that, I mean, important part of that is um, that we are assuring that our trucks are running completely on 100% green hydrogen. That means also in the production of hydrogen, there is no CO2 emission. And by doing that, I think the implication or the the, the impact on the on the on the nature on the um, on the environment is pretty clear. I mean, with every truck, we'll save 65 tons of, of CO2 every year. So the more trucks, the better. And like you said, I mean, driving the Nexo as well, if I'm driving a Nexo and I sit somewhere, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm cleaning the air with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool feeling to like drive through a city and know that you're purifying the air as you're going. It's uh, exactly. the opposite of what usually happens. <laughs> All right, so Stefan, I have a, a question from the audience for you. So hydrogen seems to be somewhat expensive. How do you plan to make your hydrogen uh, production with renewable energy cost competitive? And when do you see it being cheaper than fossil fuels? Yeah, actually, there's there's two elements to this. First of all, we should not underestimate, you know, what what it means now today's uh, fossil fuels. You know, essentially, you drill a hole into the ground and you pump something out, and uh, and that quite obviously is not that expensive. And uh, we compare that with a really complicated technology and uh, also a very advanced technology. But what's uh, there's two aspects. First of all. Uh, we're at the beginning of a scaling. So th this technology, I think technologically, it's already quite mature, as, as we have also heard from Hyundai. Uh, but what, what's missing at the moment is industrialization. And industrialization is going to make things less expensive and we've seen that for instance from solar pv how how the prices have been driven down uh, we will see something similar also for the uh, for the hydrogen technology and that's one aspect on, and the second aspect that we need to consider is that is that uh, if you compare, for instance, internal combustion engine uh, engine with a hydrogen uh, drivetrain with a fuel cell, a fuel cell is more efficient. Uh, so the higher efficiency will allow us to use less energy and then the energy actually can be a little bit more expensive and we are still going to be on par. But it, it will take, obviously will take time, uh, but but also what we need is scale. So uh, in industrialization means we have to generate a lot of projects so that uh, the industries can in, uh, increase their uh, capacities, they can improve their technologies, straighten also their, their supply chains and everything. That's, that's just a process, a normal process in, in, in industrialization. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so Mark, I think this question is for you. Um, it's a difficult time to balance the ongoing development of battery electric vehicles and, re and the ramp up of hydrogen technology. Uh, will hydrogen gradually overtake as the priority for Hyundai? Uh, that's from Felix Page from Autocar. I would guess that, um, and I think it was mentioned by Albert Biermann before early in the, in the conference, um, we're going for both. We're going for battery electric and for fuel cell technology. And I think both technologies um, are good for certain applications. Um, to be honest, what I 
what I really hate is that those discussions with, you know, battery guys bashing the fuel cell guys and or the technology and, and vice versa, right? I mean, yeah. CO2 is the enemy and whatever saves CO2 is fine with me. If it's going to be battery or fuel cell technology, um, that doesn't that doesn't matter um but i think both technologies will um will have their place in the future yeah it's it's interesting i i actually talked to uh, your yogosh tatsin makakas ab about this same question and i found it pretty intriguing that his his response about this ev versus uh, hydrogen was that uh, people are just used to something and you're gonna get this pushback you know about like uh this like intense battle that we seem to be seeing between hydrogen and battery electric that he, he just kind of said, it'll go on for a few years, then everyone will see the light. And I was like, okay, so a few more years of this intense battle. <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's, it's energy in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, I, you should spend that energy on the battery and on the fuel cell side to tackle CO2 emissions. Yeah, exactly. I see them being very complementary technologies. Um, so, uh, Mar Marcus, I actually have a question for you. Uh, will we see global H2 distribution and uh, trade like with the oil? Do you think it's going to like evolve similarly? So, like tankers taking H2 from continent continent to continent? Yeah, I'm pretty sure about that. That yeah. this will take place. Uh, I mean, coming back to what already the government has envisioned. Uh, that about 80% of the hydrogen needs to be imported by 2030. You can ask the question, where should the hydrogen come from? And uh, I mean, there are places like in Chile, Northern Africa, uh, wherever you have abundant renewable energy available, but the challenge to import or transport this energy from A to B, I think hydrogen will be a very suitable carrier molecule and as such will be traded like oil and gas in the future. I mean, like oil and gas in the future as today will be traded uh, in the future as the energy carrier. And uh, how, how, how soon do you think that'll be a reality? I can see that already starting in the next five years on okay. a commercial basis and I mean on a small scale basis and uh, as what it was mentioned by Mark before it needs to develop in terms of scale it needs to develop in terms of uh, competitiveness and technology and as such, it will become a very, very strong, uh, let's say, element in the global energy supply scheme. Okay. And uh, this, I think this one goes out to uh, the, the whole group. So are there certain vehicle segments or applications that will never be suitable for hydrogen fuel cell technology? I, I wasn't sure of the answer to that one either. That's why I asked it. <laughs> oh, everyone seems to be like, no, it's uh, completely uh, yeah, cool I'm across the board. The I'm probably the wrong person to address that question. That I guess that's a question for Mark. <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just I'm just thinking about that. Probably a baby stroller, yeah, but that would be still cool. <laughs> Future, but but I mean, you ski scooters with. Um, I mean, there are already scooters. There are um, bicycles even with yeah. small fuel cell. I'm not talking about the big applications like ships, like trains, like even even airplanes. And that will be, um, you know, probably Bertrand Picard flying the first one around the world. Um, to be honest, I I would see. I, I cannot, cannot think of anything movable which will probably not be in the long future, basically, be possibly running on hydrogen. Uh, but may, may I add one point in mm. regards to to the import of um, what Marcus talked about, about Absolutely. the import of, of hydrogen? I think it's, it, it, we should not think that, okay, with every more tr with, with every truck or with every car whatsoever, we need to, we cannot um, um, produce the hydrogen by ourselves. It needs to be imported somewhere from, from Africa or whatsoever. I think there's so much energy um, which we cannot utilize. From, from what I um, understand is just last year in, in, Euro in Germany, we talked about five terawatt hours of energy just not being able to be produced because the grid capacity cannot handle that. So that is enough electricity to produce hydrogen for 15,000 trucks, right? So the electricity is there, but it's more a political question in regards to how can we utilize that? I mean, currently, Germany is spending about a billion euro um, to, to, to pay as a remedy for, for not producing the electricity, which is kind of 
weird, <laughs> let me put it this way. But it's a huge politically discu political discussion, but energy is there. Right? And we're not talking about saving energies in, from, from other applications. I mean, you just look at your daily life where you could save electricity or energy in general. And Stefan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that it depends a little bit on the time scales. Uh, uh, if we want to completely decarbonize our society, you know, then to, to, so if you charge the amount of electricity that you need for that, uh, it's going to be more than double than what we produce today. Uh, and so it, it's it's kind of the, the complete decarbonization, we will not be able to produce those amounts of electricity here. Uh, locally and also from an efficiency point of view, it doesn't make too much sense because our solar resources are not that strong, like for instance, in Northern Africa. So that's why I believe in the long run, it, it's actually, it will be a model that we, that we uh, like today, oil as well. We, we, we produce at some place and then import uh, into our, for instance, Central Europe. Uh, but for the moment, of course, we, we are able to produce what we need locally. Uh, which is also important because we simply don't have the infrastructures yet to transport large amounts of hydrogen over long distances. But in the long run, we will have to develop such an international and global energy uh, or hydrogen supply. I absolutely agree with Marcus on that. Excellent. So I have a, an, a question from uh, Eduardo. Uh, so which is the right threshold in kilometer of autonomy for switching f uh, from a BEV to a fuel cell car? I think that's for you, Mark. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I would say it's it's not just kilometer range. It's a combination of um, kilometers. It's 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 it's, it's your, the payload you need as well, and obviously the infrastructure. Um, it might be that for a truck, for a smaller truck, battery electric does the job, and then just two blocks down the road, um, similar application. Um, fuel cell would be uh, the, the better solution for that. So I don't think it's that black and white that you can say, okay, everything with, you know, when you need a range more than 150.2 kilometers, um, you better switch to fuel cell. It's it's a mixture of how do you utilize your vehicle? Uh, how do you recharge the vehicle? Um, and, and how do you refuel? Where can you refuel the vehicle? And, and all those different um, aspects in there. So I think it's not just a kilometer range. And um, Me Megan actually, I think, has a good follow-up for that one. Um, how quickly do you see a fuel tech, a fuel cell tech rollout across the heavy-duty truck segment? Do you think it'll be by the end of the decade, or do you think it's going to be a sort of mix for the European fleet? I mean, it will take. It, I mean, I'm not saying that we will completely um, replace diesel engines by, by hydrogen within the next uh, decade. I don't think so. But there will be a significant amount of hydrogen trucks driving around within the next um, couple of years. I mean, just in Switzerland, we will have 1,000 vehicles by 2023 um, in customer operation. Already by the end of the year, we'll have 50 vehicles. I mean, that's not that huge of an amount, but we'll have 50 vehicles in the country. Actually, we're converting the first 10 as we 10 vehicles as we speak. So, by that, then once you have, like I explained earlier, the infrastructure and everything, that will be a self-propelling um, system. And if we can utilize, or if we can, if we can find business cases like that in other countries as well, I think that will. Um, We'll see some significant amount of um, trucks and also buses as well um, in, the, in the future. It's not that in 10 years every diesel truck will be placed. That would be unrealistic. Okay, and uh, th this is a question uh, to the entire group. Uh, do you see a conflict between allocating resources between EV and H2? Um, we've we've touched on this j j just briefly now uh, before, but I think I think it is a, a very important question because when people talk about it, they speak about it like it's one or the other. When over the course of the day, we've seen that it's it's fairly complementary. So how do you how do you see the resources being allocated over the next ten years? I, I think I with the effort of <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> a, a, 
perhaps we, uh, the answer is also in, uh, in the action plans of the European Union. The European Union has now recognized that hydrogen is an important element and it's, a, it's about allocating resources. It's, it, it's about judging, you know, what, what is the right combination, what is the right mix and already that, uh, that these action plans now are established is the proof that, uh, that also the governments have understood that uh, they have to make decisions, you know, just to, just to build up the right combination of infrastructures, uh, and this is uh, and this is probably the most important step. And that I don't really see a conflict of uh, of allocating resources. It's a, uh, it's a, and, and we should also not forget uh, the third element. It's the customer who makes the choice what uh, he actually wants to use, and and uh, so the, uh, the 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 speed of uh, which which infrastructure establishes depends also on the customers' preferences and needs. M Marcus, I, I I know that you wanted yeah. to jump in there. Yeah, I think there's probably not a one-fits-all solution which is the best, uh, and I think it's by far too early to judge and uh, make a choice is either the one or the other solution. I think both um, multiple options need to have a fair chance to further develop. And uh, I think yes, it's a matter of competition between the technologies on the one hand side, but uh, again, um, there's no, no one optimum for a specific customer. There may be two options and uh, as Mark already mentioned, uh, the next customer down the road may have a different preference, a different set of requirements, and probably a different solution will be the one of choice for the one. But uh, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's right to have this uh, multiple ways forward that we can be trying to pursue in order to develop various options. And I think at the end, it will be a mix of various solutions that will build the very much comprehensive energy mix and solution and different value chains that will blend into one solution, providing the hydrogen to the customer. Mark, did you have anything to add to that? No, actually, Stefan, Stefan said exactly what I wanted exactly. to add. Um, it's, not a, it's, it's not an either or. Um, I think it's uh, both technologies will, actually the customer will decide at the end of the day um, what's more convenient from a cost perspective, from a practicality perspective at the end of the day, the end consumer will, will tell us. Um, there's, there's one question that I did want, this is actually from me. Um, when you talk to people about fuel cell in general, you talk like I, I, I see it the way a lot of people do that it makes perfect sense in trucks, right? It's fast to fuel, it's very efficient, it's like it's got all the torque that you want. Um, but then everyone always says, yeah, but passenger vehicles, it's the efficiency is not there, it's definitely going to be EV. Right, but to me, I think it does make sense, like with autonomous drive, that it rolls out in trucks first, right? Because the infrastructure is set, the routes are planned, the trucks are going in a certain way. With autonomous drive, you can, you know, have all the IoT to help the trucks. With, you know, the fuel cell charging stations, you can put them on the planned route, and then everything's cool. Um, but then, to me, I've never really understood why. You know, like everyone just says, well, yeah, it's going to be for trucks, but it's not going to be for cars. Um, like, when will that tipping point happen in people's thoughts that it's, it, it will be good for both? You mean autonomous or hydrogen? Well, I'm just making the, the comparison of tech that like autonomous makes sense for trucks first because like the routes are planned, right? So like to me, like uh, the, the routes are also planned for, for like all trucking routes are planned. Right, like there's like corridors of highways where the trucks always drive. It's not like a passenger car where it's like driving willy nilly around the city, right? So, like it's it's a little more difficult for um, planning of autonomous drive with like blind left turn, and it's also a little bit more difficult for planning of hydrogen fueling stations. So, like I see why a lot of tech is driving towards uh, trucks first because they're more predictable. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, but when like when you talk to experts, everyone just kind of dismisses passenger car, right? Like they dismiss it like hydrogen makes sense, but it doesn't make sense for a passenger car. I think the problem is that that uh, this is first of all, uh, it is in kind of the, the, this old discussion. It's it's one or the other, which is already wrong as we have discussed before. 
Uh, and the second part is, I think, when it comes, for instance, to autonomous driving, I don't see how that the, the, the this is a separate technology which is not really related to the propulsion uh, the technology. This can be applied to also to uh, to uh, gasoline and diesel cars. But in the end, I think it, it is really up to the customer to decide what's right for him. And uh, we have a tendency just to just to reduce that just to some technological questions, but we should not n not underestimate the customer there. I mean, there's a reason why customers, even if they only uh, require a very small car, uh, they still buy uh, an SUV. And uh, and this is the important aspect. This this is not only this is not only technology. That there's a, there's a human involved there. And I think that that's actually a, a pretty good statement to end things on, that it, it is up to us, that it is the consumer who is driving a lot of, a lot of these uh, d decisions. And over the course of today, I'd like to thank you guys for kind of bringing a lot of this back around and kind of like showing the use case for hydrogen as a realistic technology that is here today and not sort of fancifully in the future. So thank you very much. So that actually draws an end to our Hyundai Tech Day. So we've had a lot of great discussions, and I've learned a lot, and I hope you have as well. Uh, if you'd like to continue the discussion online, I'm very much sure that all of the hashtags for Hyundai would be more than happy to engage with you. So my name is Nicole Scott. Again, I'm a technology journalist and a mobility enthusiast, and now a little bit smarter about hydrogen, as I hope you are too. Thank you very much.